1964, particle physics went to the next level. Before, we only knew about protons and neutrons, but it turns out they were made of something smaller. Interestingly enough, working independently from each other, Murray Glellman and George Thybee both came to the conclusion that protons and neutrons were made of smaller particles, but it was Glenn Mann who named the quark from the book he read by James Joyce. However, he pronounced them quarks instead of quarks. One of the things we need to keep in mind is that all particles have an electromagnetic charge, whether that be one, zero, negative one, the charge of protons, neutrons and electrons respectively. It is also possible to get a charge of 2 or minus 2, but what you need to take from this is that the charge has to be an integer value. Now forget everything I just said because protons and neutrons are made up of quarks, and quarks are one of three major groups known as elementary particles. Just like leptons, there are six type or flavors of quarks. Half are known as uptype quarks, which all have a positive charge, and the other half are known as downtype quarks, which all have a negative charge. Funny enough, the first generation quarks are up and down. The uptype quarks are up, charm and top, and all have a charge of plus two thirds. While the downtype quarks are down, strange and bottom, which all have a charge of minus one third. You see the massive contradiction? So why is it that particles have to have an integer charge while quarks can have fractions? It is because you can't get quarks to exist on their own they are always found with at least one other quark to make a whole charge. Quarks are held together by the strong nuclear force, and when they are together, they are known as hadrons. You know, from the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. You might remember from the Big Bang video, that there was a time when quarks could exist on their own, but that was like 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Hadrons make up most of the composite particles, and both protons and neutrons are hadrons. A proton is actually made up of two uptypes and one downtype quark, which gives it a charge of one. So a neutron is made up of one up and two downtype quarks. Any hadron made of three quarks is known as a baryon. But also, mesons involve quarks, but also antiquarks. Mesons are a type of hadron that has one quark and an antiquark, so they only have two instead of the normal three. With uptype quarks having a charge of plus two thirds and downtype quarks having a charge of minus one third, there is no way of combining them to get a one whole charge. So antiquarks are involved. Antiquarks are one of the antiparticles with antileptons and antibosons. Antiquarks are the same as normal quarks except they have the opposite charge to their counterparts. For instance, the most common meson, the pion, is made of one uptype quark and one down antiquark, thus giving it a charge of one. The best part about antimatter is that it's basically the same as matter except for a few changes. The main one is that the charges are flipped, but there are also a few other things. In the theory, there could be an antimatter Earth somewhere and everything is the same, but all the charges are flipped. And the few other things that I was talking about. But for reasons that we are only just starting to grasp, there was a massive event where matter outnumbered antimatter and nearly destroyed all of it. The beautiful thing about antiquarks is that they're an elementary antiparticle. The same goes for antineutrinos and antielectrons, aka the positron, but there are also composite antiparticles like antiprotons and antineutrons, and the relationship between elementary and composite antiparticles isn't as simple as normal matter. Looking at the pion, it's a composite particle due to the fact that it has a quark and an antiquark. Because of this very fact, it is equal parts elementary particle and elementary antiparticle. The antipion is made up of a down quark and an up antiquark, so it's the same half and half. The reason the matter and antimatter partnership doesn't destroy each other is because they're not a pair. A pair is a matter and antimatter equivalent, so an up quark and an up antiquark, they would destroy each other. This also explains why antineutrons can exist. If antimatter has opposite charges, how can you have a neutron with an opposite charge? It doesn't, it just finds another way to get to zero. Whereas a normal neutron is made up of an up and two downs, an anti-neutron is made up of an anti-up and two anti-downs. 
So the net charge is the same, and so this is why that we can have anti-neutrons, and that's why they'll also annihilate each other. So quarks have some interesting features. The top quark is massively heavier than the rest of them, whereas the bottom quark is only a little bit heavier than the charm quark. Because the top quark is so heavy, it doesn't hang around for long enough to do anything, and we only really know it's there because of its byproducts. The strange quark is one that there is actually rather a lot of study has gone into. Originally found in a lambda particle, there was a property of the particle which caused it to stick around for so long, and this was dubbed the strangeness, and then we just went and found the source. So in a lambda particle, there is an up and a down, but then there's something else, so we call that the strange particle as it was causing the strangeness. Lambda was expected to live for about 10 to the minus 23 seconds as the lambda particle is involved in the strong interactions, which normally leads to a very short lifetime. But this new extended lifetime brought about conservation of strangeness. The issue is that in order for it to stick around so long, the strange quark needs to change into other types of quark in order to sustain this lifetime. All the quarks are affected by the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force. The strong nuclear force is obvious due to the fact that they stick together because of the strong nuclear force. This is due to quark colours, but I'll talk about that in a second. They are also affected by the weak nuclear force, by quantum electrodynamics. When a down quark turns into an up quark, it releases a W- boson. The W- boson will be covered in the next lesson on the standard model. And the W bosons are all related to the weak nuclear force along with the Z boson. And as quarks have electric charge, they are affected by the electromagnetic force. It can't overpower the strong nuclear force till further away. This is why an atom's nucleus isn't ripped apart. So how can we be so confident that these quarks are here because we've never actually seen them? never isolated them. And there is good reason for this. The colour force, that's the posh name for the exchange of gluons, which I will talk about in a second, I promise, doesn't drop off with distance like other observed forces. It is thought that it might even increase with distance. Free quarks are not observed because by the time the separation becomes visible to us, the energy levels are so high that quark-antiquark pairs can form and ruin everything. Basically, you can't get one on its own. The only type of visualization is called the bag model. You basically imagine the quark as being trapped inside an elastic bag, but inside the bag it is allowed to move freely, as long as you don't try and pull the quarks apart. If you try and take one of the quarks out of the bag, it will stretch and resist. Another way of looking at it is that when you try and take a quark out of a proton by striking it with other high energy particles, the quark experiences a potential energy barrier from the strong interaction and this increases with distance. But due to quantum tunneling, other particles which have a barrier higher than the particle energy doesn't mean it can't escape, like alpha radiation can escape. But this is helped by the fact that as the alpha particle moves further away, it becomes easier to escape, unlike the quark. I know that is complicated and hard to imagine, but moving on. To interpret quarks as an actual physical entity propose two major problems. Spin and the fact that they refuse to split up. This is all solved with colour, which is actually known as quantum chromodynamics. In the theory of strong interactions, colour doesn't mean the colour of everyday world but rather the property of the quarks which causes a strong nuclear force. The colours are red, green and blue, which are all ascribed to quarks, and then there's anti-red, anti-green and anti-blue to the anti-quarks. According to QCD, all combinations of quarks must contain a combination of these colours which will cancel out and leave it with no colour overall. A baryon will always consist of one red, one green and one blue quark, and will never violate this rule. This is where gluons, a form of boson, comes in and transmits the force. The colour is simple to remember. All quarks must have one red, one green and one blue. However, there are eight gluons. Six of them have two colours. One of them has four and the last one has six. The combinations are red and anti-green, green and anti-red, blue and anti-red, red and anti-blue, green and anti-blue, blue and anti-green, red, green, anti-red and anti-green, and then all of them. 
Quarks can change their colour as they emit and absorb gluons, so the exchange of gluons maintains the proper colour distribution. Basically, if the colour isn't neutral, it will find a way to make it neutral. And so that's the video on quarks, however strange or charming they may be. Stay tuned to the next lesson. Thank you for listening.